So how much sleep do we need exactly? Well, it depends on the person. And genetically speaking, a lot of it can be influenced based purely on your DNA. Some people are totally capable of going, you know, five or six hours a night, and they can do that and function no problem. For others, they need um, significantly more than that. Um, for you, since you're teenagers, you guys are developing, you know, and you're growing much faster than adults do. So you need more sleep than adults. Adults typically will go for seven or eight hours. That's what they need. For you guys, it's substantially more, anywhere from 10 to 11 hours. And most of you guys, are you're lucky if you get like six, because you go to bed at like midnight and you'll wake up, you know, right around 6.30 to be able to catch your bus or, you know, be able to grab your ride from uh, your house and your neighborhood to get to school. So you're really hurting yourself in the long run because one of the things that we'll discuss in a bit is sleep debt. You never make up for your brain when you lose out on sleep. So if you sleep for five hours one night and then you try to make up for it with like 12 hours the next, um, not only are you messing up your circadian rhythm, but you're going to feel less rested um, and you're going to feel probably more tired and it just your brain is not going to be able to make that up and have that restorative property restored. So as I said, your brain keeps track of the amount of sleep that you get and what you don't get. And so your brain doesn't make it possible for you to make up for lost sleep. Your brain keeps track of how much sleep you lose. It will keep track for about two weeks and then it'll kind of reset based off of circadian rhythms that have been you know, established periodically. So it's, re it's really necessary for you to be at your full best to get a decent night's sleep every night fairly consistently. So that way your brain is at its full capacity. Sleep deprivation does have physiological and uh, psychological effects. Sleep deprivation studies have shown us that it is a necessary biological function for you to get sleep. If you don't get enough of it, you can have significant difficulty focusing. Uh, many of you have that. Anytime I turn down the lights when we do an activity in class, uh, I would say a third of you look like you're about ready to pass out on me within five minutes of that happening. So very, very decreased focus. You have a greater tendency to make mistakes because your focusing ability is diminished and you have diminished productivity. You're very tired and very irritable. And here's the other thing about sleep. Sleep and um, the amount that you're getting, it's very much linked to the strength of your immune system. If you're not getting much sleep, your, your body recognizes that, and so your immune system gets kind of suppressed in the process, and so you're not as easily able to fight anything off if you get the cold or a flu or something like that. And it's possible after 72 hours of sleep deprivation to have full-blown hallucinatory experiences. So it's incredibly important that you make sure you are getting the necessary amount of sleep that you need every night. The National Sleep Foundation, disturbingly enough, found that over half of Americans are getting the amount of sleep that they need. And I guarantee if I were to give a quiz on you know, sleep debt and sleep deprivation, many of us would be in the same boat. We're just not getting enough of it. 37% of people said that they were so tired during the day that it completely interfered with their ability to carry out daily activities. That's disordered behavior. If you can't function normally during a day, that is very much a, a, an aspect of a disorder. 40% of people said that they tried to compensate for lost sleep during the week on the weekends, um, and it ended up throwing things off. And any one of us can talk about that, how we feel, um, you know, we still feel really tired over the weekends for the most part. 43% use caffeine to help them stay awake during the day. I am a testament to that. And any of you guys that uh, I see walking in the hallways with monsters or you know, coffee, you could say that too. 51%, this to me is the most disturbing um, characteristic of these statistics right here. 51% of people have said that they drove drowsy during that, that year that this study was carried out. Very, very disturbing when you think about the fact that they are operating a two-ton machine 
Um, and so many accidents end up being caused because a driver falls asleep at the wheel or they're just too tired to be able to focus enough while they're on the road. I get a lot of questions from students about naps when we move into altered states of consciousness and talk about sleeping because they really want to know why we nap. Is it a normal thing? Is it because, you know, we're sleep deprived and we're just really tired? Um, are we wired to do it? Why is it that we need to have a nap? Biologically speaking, you are actually wired to have naps. So it's totally normal for you to feel kind of sleepy 12 hours past the midpoint of your main period of sleep. So there's a reason why for most of us we feel pretty tired right in between like 2 and 5 in the afternoon, 2 p.m. and 5 p.m. because that is usually 12 hours past the midpoint of when most of us are asleep. So Sam right here. If Sam went to bed at 10 p.m., woke up at 8 a.m., if only we could all be so lucky as to get to sleep in to 8 a.m. during most of the week, his midpoint of that main period of sleep would be 3 a.m. Tack on 12 hours to that, he'd probably want to nap at 3. So this is why many of us end up getting really sleepy right when we get home from school. So next time you want to go home and uh, take a nap and your parents are nagging at you, Tell them that it is totally normal for you to do this and it's actually really beneficial. If you take a 45 minute nap, it goes a long way in improving your alertness all the way up until like, you know, six hours. Uh, it improves mood. It makes you a lot less um, irritable and cranky. Um, but here's the thing. We also know through research that if you take a nap that is longer than 45 minutes, it means that you have um, pretty significant sleep deficits, okay? So it's an indication that your body is really, really trying um, to get some extra sleep. To give you an indication of just how much sleep debt I have during the school year, if I fall asleep and take a nap, I end up sleeping for about two hours. So that is a really long time past 45 minutes. There are multiple different explanations for why we sleep, what it does for us. One is that sleep protects. If when we were Cro-Magnon man, we were asleep at night when predators would be more easily able to get us, um, you know, animals that, you know, lions and tigers and, you know, those that would be kind of out for you. Um, if we slept during the night, it was much more protecting um, because we wouldn't find ourselves getting into problems because you didn't have, you know, uh, street lights and all that other kind of stuff back during that time. So sleep actually protects us and that's why they argue we sleep at night rather than during the day. Sleep recuperates. It helps us to restore ourselves to feel like we have more energy, okay? And it also helps to repair body tissue and brain tissue as well. It's going to help us with remembering things. REM sleep in particular is very beneficial for our ability to have memories, to maintain them and to prevent them from fading. Sleep and growth is also important too. When you are asleep, your pituitary gland releases growth hormone. So older people, they don't need as much growth hormone, so it's not released as much when they're asleep. And they also don't need to sleep as much because they're not growing. So the reason why you guys need so much sleep is because you're still growing, as we said earlier. So you need that time for the pituitary to be able to release growth hormone as you sleep. Now let's talk sleeping disorders. First is insomnia, okay? This is when you have significant difficulty either falling asleep or staying asleep. In some scenarios, it can be a combination of both. Um, this is definitely something that I experience. I will wake up during the night um, on average anywhere from three to seven or eight times during the night. It's very difficult for me to stay asleep. Don't have any problems falling asleep necessarily. It's just I don't get the ability to go through um, a full night of restful sleep. I think the last time I had one of those was probably about um, a year and a half ago. So it's been a while. Narcolepsy is a very overpowering sense of sleepiness, okay? So what happens is you fall asleep instantly into REM stage, okay? And there's no controlling it. It just happens. This little guy down here, this is Skeeter. Skeeter is a narcoleptic poodle. 
Uh, he is all over YouTube if you want to go find out about him now, but we are going to watch his situation when we get to class together. Um, but the sleep attacks that happen with narcolepsy, they go at most um, five minutes. They're typically very, very quick. Um, but obviously, think about ha having an ability to drive. I mean, you, just, you wouldn't be able to do that with narcolepsy. And so it's very impactful in terms of normal, everyday, daily functioning. Night terrors are another type of sleep disorder. They involve um, just very sudden arousal from sleep, so you wake up very, very fast. It's just intense level of fear um, for those that have them. And then there's you know physiological reactions, so you know, sweating. Um, it's not the same as a nightmare, and the key reason behind that is that if a, you know if you were to be woken up during a nightmare, you would remember it typically. For night terrors, however, um, if you let a child not you know, wake up during it, if you don't wake them up during it, they're not going to remember it in the morning. So that's one of the key um, differentiations between night terrors and nightmares. They tend to be related to a fear that a child has. You can also have sleep apnea. Sleep apnea involves when you have an inability to breathe consistently during the night. So you can wake up literally hundreds of times and not even realize that this is happening because you just can't breathe while you're asleep. Oftentimes it's accompanied with snoring, so many of us are familiar with that, but that's not always the case. Snoring doesn't necessarily equal sleep apnea. Treatments include uh, encouraging those that have sleep apnea to lose weight. You could also um, put them on medications. Some surgeries are involved, although they try to avoid those. But you can do something like this. This is called a CPAP. Um, what it does is a machine that you put over your mouth and your nose, and when you sleep, it forces air down your, uh, basically down your throat to your lungs, so that way it ensures that you're breathing consistently so you won't wake up. And it has proven to be incredibly beneficial for those that use it. Sleep walking. This occurs during stage four. So this is when you're in your deepest stage. So this is why it's very difficult to, to wake people up when they're sleepwalking. It is totally fine for you to wake someone up from sleepwalking. There are a lot of people out there that say that it, you'll cause lasting damage to a person if that happens, which is very much not the case. Sleepwalking is when someone just has a very blank stare. They'll move about in a very slow, kind of um, zombie-like manner. Um, they can try to eat while they're asleep, get dressed, go to work, go to the bathroom in the wrong place. Um, Ambien was sued in a class action lawsuit at one point because it was causing people to sleep drive, interestingly enough. So um, it, it is possible to have you know very strange experiences with sleepwalking. REM behavior disorder, this is typically found for men, middle age or you know heading into their, their elderly stages. Sometimes it seems to be linked with Parkinson's disease, but what happens is the muscles don't paralyze themselves when you go through REM. So you will act out oftentimes very vivid and violent dreams while you're experiencing this disordered behavior. Um, again, I'll show you a video of what this is like when we get into class with one another together.